have Prof. Mansour Salam is going to continue his series of sessions on vascular anatomy, this time talking about subclavian artery obstruction syndromes. Uh, we'll start with Prof. Samah. Prof. Samah, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Hatim. Uh, good evening, everybody. I can see some participants. I welcome you all. Uh, I welcome Ahmed Nada as an Egyptian colleague who got his MD from Al Azhar. So he, he is sharing us a lot of things. Uh, we have been talking about uh, TCI, coronary angiography, and a lot of uh, interesting things. And we at Al Azhar used to meet regularly in uh, regular meetings. And this is a gathering of the cardiology and the cardiac surgery team in Al Azhar University in 1920. Uh, I think you I didn't am, share your slides. I, I share it. No. Are you sure? 100%, yeah. Okay. Share. Share. Okay. Yes. You can you can see my slides now. Yes. Now we okay. can. Okay. Okay. So uh, mm -hmm. this is uh, the Department of Cardiology and uh, our colleagues from the cardiac surgery in one of the meetings that was held uh, probably four years ago. Uh, we have been talking about coronary angiography, PCI, and a lot of interesting things. But uh, today I'll throw some light about the bad face of PCI. Let us say it's the other face, that's not bad face. Uh, but uh, I'll ask first who is the expert in uh, the case lab? Is he the one who manipulates the wire? False. Is he the one who inflates the balloon? False. Is he the one that deploys the synth? False. Who is then the expert? The expert in the field of intervention is the one who knows what to do safely, safely to help his patient. He knows when to discontinue doing unsuccessful procedure. The one who is, if unable to benefit his patient, he will never cause harm. So let us look at the good face first. This is a very nice demonstration of a subtotal LED lesion that in 15 minutes will open nicely with TME3 flow in the coronary arteries uh, here. And this is another uh, example of uh, totally occluded LED that is in 20, 30 minutes in acute coronary syndrome was opened nicely with semi three flow uh, in the coronary vessels. And this is another example, uh, totally occluded LED uh, that was opened and you can see uh, the distal part of the LED. Again, LED, a very long total occlusion that was uh, saved and opened and, uh, uh, and it's very nice now. A subtotal LED again, and it was nicely opened and the stent was deployed. And this is a good phase for the PCR. Again, LED here, and it is open again. So that you can open an occluded vessel. RCA type lesion, uh, pass the wire, inflate the balloon, put the stent, the RCA is now opened. Uh, LED again, subtotal occlusion just after the diagonal branch, and it is now opened in a few minutes with your balloon and a stent. Uh, acute coronary syndrome, uh, right coronary artery thrombotic occlusion, and it was open and the distal circulation and the right coronary artery uh, are seen. Uh, this is a circumflex uh, tight lesion before it uh, gives the origin to the obtuse marginal branch. Now it is opened and nicely opened and you have saved the obtuse marginal branch and the circumflex, and you are saving the myocardium in this area. Uh, I'll ask our colleagues now, why should we study the bad face of PCI then? If we have all these good news, why should we study it? Uh, if we uh, examine our patients, take a good history, uh, examine the patients, uh, prepare ourselves, we would be able to predict the probability of, of complications. 
And if we are expecting and predicting complication, we have to do our best to avoid the situations that may lead to its occurrence. And even if it occurs, we will be able to recognize it very early if it occurs. And once it occurs, we will be ready to deal with any case of complication once it happens. So knowing that this procedure is having a complication, we have to predict it. We have to avoid the situation that led to its occurrence. We had to recognize it once it occurs and we have to be able to deal with it once it happens. Uh, what is the actual vascular response to intervention procedure? If we are uh, going for intervention, uh, balloon dilatation stint, what, what are we doing actually? We are causing reasonable controlled injury for a therapeutic purpose. This is what we are actually doing uh, during our procedure, PCA, PTCA and the stenting. A reasonable controlled injury for a therapeutic reason. What is meant by reasonable controlled injury? We cause intimal fracture. We cause intimal splitting. We, co we cause stretching and localize the section of the media muscle fiber. We cause a reversible stretch of the adventitia once we inflate the balloon within the artery. So all the layers, intima, media, adventitia, are affected by balloon inflation <clears throat> and by uh, our manipulation with uh, the balloon and the stent. So this is the intima here, this is a media here, and this is adventitia at the end. All are affected by uh, our uh, therapeutic uh, procedure, which is balloon dilatation and stent. Now, why complication occurs? Uh, what is the mechanism of occurrence of complications? Uncontrolled exaggeration of angioplasty induced the injury. So to open a vessel, you will cause a reasonable injury for a therapeutic purpose. To prevent the complication, make this angioplasty induced injury under control. Balloon to balloon, balloon to vessel ratio, uh, mm -hmm. how much balloon uh, should I use? Uh, how long the balloon is? Uh, to which uh, pressure should I inflate the balloon? Uh, is it uh, 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 balloon, which type of balloon I'm using? And in addition to the angio angioplasty induced injury, activation of co coagulation cascade, increased vasco vasomotor tone, and the direct result of angioplasty procedures. Uh, these are the causes of complications during uh, manipulation uh, of our uh, patients. To prevent these complications, we have to keep the therapeutic injury under control by controlling the above uh, mentioned mechanisms. So that's why we are using coagulation cascade, activation of coagulation cascade. Uh, why we, do, do we use antiplatelets, so heparin, uh, colopedo, grill, and, and, and. So increased vasomotor tone, and uh, this is especially very active during the acute coronary syndrome, and we have to uh, keep in mind all these complications. Who are the susceptible patients to develop complications during PCI? There are clinical factors or clinical uh, relationship. Old age are more prone, female gender are more prone, present acute coronary syndrome and acute myocardial infarction with thrombus burden is liable to complications, and stable angina patients, patients who had uh, congestive heart failure and uh, acute coronary syndrome or uh, chronic stable an angina. Uh, patients who underwent previous uh, cabbage are more prone to complications. And there are anatomic factors that make this pa the patients more susceptible to <clears throat> complications. Totally occluded coronary arteries are more prone to complications, long lesions, bend more than 45 degrees, presence of calcification, visible uh, thrombus, osteal lesion, severe proximal tortuosity. These are anatomical factors that precipitates the lesion and the patient to develop complications during PCI. For example, this is heavily calcified coronary artery. When this is seen, I, one would expect the calcification in this calcified lesion that complications may occur in these patients. Calcification here and calcification there in both patients. Long lesions like this one, 
are more prone to complications. And this is a long lesion again, are more prone to, to complications in LED and lateral view. Uh, chronic total occlusion, uh, and this is chronic total occlusion again with autocollaterals. Uh, and this is long lesion again here, the circumflex artery. And this is the course of the artery when, uh, when it fills uh, retrogradely from the LAD. Uh, so chronic total occlusion, tortuous vessels in this cor right coronary artery with very tight lesions, multiple lesions here. This is the tortuosity of the vessel makes it liable to uh, complications. If you are happy, the occluded segment will not be tortuous, but if uh, the lesion comes here in the torsus portion of the segment of the coronary artery. This will be more prone to uh, complications. Uh, multivessel disease, if you, you, there is a calcified lesion here in the circumflex <clears throat> and it involves the origin of obtuse marginal branch. So you are dealing with a very significant calcified lesion involving the two major branches. On the other, on the other hand, the same patient have uh, a calcified lesion in the LAD with uh, diagonals and the septals are there. These patients will be more suitable to complications. Softness vein grafts are more suitable to uh, complications. Long lesions like these are more prone to complications. And bend, lesions at a bend, especially, there is a, an a angle between the major, the branch, major uh, branch here and the main vessel. Uh, there is a very tight lesion and the main vessel and the ossea of a major artery which are which arises uh, at 90 degrees centigrade uh, lesion at angle like this lesion uh, all these will be susceptible to uh, complications uh, thrombus burden you can see here how the thrombus burden is very important in uh, the LED in acute coronary syndrome so what are the possible complications that may occur during PCI? Coronary artery dissection may occur, abrupt closure, acute stent thrombosis, no reflow, perforation and the coronary rupture, distal coronary embolization and microcirculation loss, stent dislodgement, balloon leakage and rupture. And I think we will have time next lectures to discuss these items in more detail. We may take one item at a time and discuss it, what are uh, uh, the causes, how would you recognize it, and how would you uh, treat it. I make it short to let uh, uh, my dear colleague, Ahmed Nada and Mansour Salam uh, speak and give us uh, their uh, talks today. Uh, thank you, and uh, I leave uh, the place for you if you anybody wants to ask me. Okay, I leave this one. Or, or leave stop share. Okay, hi. <clears throat> Mr. Ahmed, please share your screen. Nice overview of uh, potential troubles that one can get into while doing PCI, and we look forward to your subsequent sessions discussing each and each of the individual items uh, in more detail, uh, with some tips and tricks on how to avoid them. Uh, Prof. Ahmed, we are looking forward to your talk. You may share your slides, please. Ahmed, we don't worry. Ahmed, we can't hear you. <laughs> أحمد في مشكلة في السماعة بتاعتك يا أحمد if he's having a trouble I can start أحمد do you hear us no. Marianne, uh, if you have a Zamila is Mariam, I was a typical to share a Kamana, Los Amati, accept everybody. Ahmed, I think there is something wrong with Ahmed. 
حاتم وكان وي ستارت ضد منصور؟ Yes, uh, Dr. Ahmed, in the interest of time, if you don't oh. mind, we'll uh, get Dr. Mansour to start his session, and then while we troubleshoot the problem uh, with <coughs> Prof. <coughs> Prof. Mansour. I think, uh, I think Ahmed didn't share his screen. I think this is an issue right now. Okay, but I can start. No, I am we, we, we couldn't hear him. Okay, no problem. So, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <coughs> it gives me pleasure and honor to start the ninth session of the Al-Azhar Radial course, Mastering Radial Approach for Coronary Procedures from Basics to Advanced. In the previous sessions, we started in depth uh, vascular anatomy of the hand, forearm, and arm, as well as we started in depth review of the subclavian and innominate arteries anatomy, normal anatomy, ab acquired abnormal anatomy like tertiary and the loops, and the congenital anomalies like arterial zuria we discussed in detail. So tonight, inshallah, we'll discuss a different topic, which is subclavian artery obstruction syndrome. However, mix of all these problems may happen together. <clears throat> when you have subclavian obstruction, one can anticipate one of these four phenomena or problems, thoracic outlet syndrome, <clears throat> subclavian steel syndrome, <clears throat> subclavian steel syndrome, and coronary subclavian steel syndrome. What are the difference among all of these? I think it will come in discussion right now. <clears throat> if you remember, when we discussed the, the vascular anatomy of the subclavian artery, we mentioned clearly that they uh, appear- uh, Mansour, Mansour, yes. excuse me. Uh, Abdul Maqsoud uh, and Ahmed Salah are raising their hands. Uh, is there any problem with them? From Abdul Maqsoud. Can you ask Dr. Mansour? Okay, full screen, Mansour. And okay, uh, I'm, I'm full screen. No, we could not. Uh, uh, we, we see your slides uh, and uh, beside and the other side. Well, incredible. I reviewed with uh, Marianne first. Okay, for no, we, but we, we, we can see both your uh, but, but this is the first. Uh, اهلا يا احمد معلش انت في مشكله عندك واحنا بدانا بمنصور معلش لا خالص 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 انا بس اهم حاجه الصوت مسموع كده واضح اه احنا كده سامعينك يا احمد شكرا جزيلا منصور انا شايف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قدامي وبقيت السلايدز كلها على جنب ازاي صوتك مين طيب اي ويل اوكي سو كان ستارت وذ احمد اند اي ويل ار يو ريدي يا احمد لا مش سامعينك برضه يا احمد احنا مش سامعينك يا احمد ويلو الصبح يا احمد عليكم السلام احمد اوكي يا احمد انت سامعنا كويس احمد في مشكله في الصوت عندك الميكروفون بتاعك فيه مشكله مش سامعين وي كود انت هيريو أيوة. السلام عليكم عليكم السلام عليكم السلام ورحمه الله انت سمعنا يا احمد احمد سمعنا يا جماعه منصور ليف ليف شير سكرين يا منصور وبعدين شير تاني السلام عليكم بروف سنة اهلا يا اي والنبي الله يخليك خليك بقى كده الصوت ده كويس كده والصوره دي زي القمر يبقى ممتاز ممتاز ار يو ريدي الله يكرمك ريدي يا احمد اوكي كان يو ستارت ناو كان يو شير سكرين يا احمد 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 Hatim. Dr. Hatim. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, can you, can you go to slide uh, view, please? We're just seeing. And we are not uh, hearing we're him. Not, we're not able to hear you either. Again, yeah, a problem Ahmed. with your mic, uh, Prof. Ahmed. We can't mm. hear you. 
We can't hear you, Ahmed. Prof. Mansour, were you able to troubleshoot the problem with your slides? The problem is Ahmed. Uh, 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 Mansour muted himself. Uh, and Ahmed is sharing the screen. I think uh, Prof. Ahmed is trying to find. Uh, Yes, um, another mic. Another mic. Mm. Okay, this right, is a technology. It. Okay, do we have any questions or uh, from the audience, Dr. Hatim? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> okay, Mansoor. Yeah, do you see my screen for you right now? Or not? We can see it now, yes. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we'll discuss today, inshallah, or tonight, subclavian artery obstruction syndrome. You see full screen right now? We stop Yes, here. yes. Okay, okay. go so ahead. Ah, okay, subclavian obstruction syndrome, once we have any obstruction, occlusion, or uh, compression from outside, we do expect one of four phenomena or uh, vascular issues. Thoracic outlet syndrome, subclavian steel syndrome, subclavian sub steel phenomena, coronary subclavian steel syndrome. Okay, we mentioned in the literature or the uh, vascular anatomy, usually the subclavian arteries originate or appear from the superior thoracic aperture. And they good. What is wrong with the cell? I think we should probably try mute our mic so there is no echo. Let's try that. Yeah. Okay. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, Mansoor. Yes. Okay. So in such a situation, the subclavian arteries curve and go out of the thoracic cavity through what is called thoracic outlet, which is bounded by the inferior border of the clavicle and superior border of the first rib and the posterior laterally by the scapula, and they go out from the thoracic outlet. Now they are out of the thoracic cage. This is a demonstration of the components of the thoracic outlet, okay, in which we have the subclavian vein, subclavian artery, and the brachial plexus. They go out right now from the uh, thoracic cavity. If any compression happens in this situation or in this segment, usually we will have what is called thoracic outlet syndrome. The commonest etiology of the thoracic outlet syndrome by far is the cervical rib, which happens in approximately 80% of situations. However, any inflammation like soft tissue abnormalities, fracture rib or fracture clavicle, fibrous band that communicates all these components together, this will result in thoracic outlet syndrome. The thoracic outlet syndrome, <clears throat> should be differentiated using the terms, depending upon which segment or which component is compressed. Arterial, so it is called ASAS, or thoracic outlet syndrome, or venous, or neurology. Uh, thoracic outlet syndrome affects approximately 8% of population. It is a huge number. I was impressed when I read in literature, 8% of population, they have thoracic outlet syndrome, mostly by far, three to four births out times in the frequent in women as opposed to men. And usually they affect the age between 20 and 50 years. That's the majority of these situations. Thoracic outlet syndrome. I think one is speaking with me. So if you can mute him, Dr. Hatim. Okay, can affect the brachial plexus. And those patients usually come with pain, paresthesia, numbness, and weakness. And in minority of situations, they affect subclavian artery, and usually they come with upper extremity ischemia, or sometimes they compress the vein, subclavian vein, and those patients present with DVT. To be frank with you, we, I have seen many patients with upper extremity DVT, but I didn't think in thoracic outlet syndrome, starting from tonight, I think we have to consider thoracic outlet syndrome as well. Pertaining to transradial intervention, usually trans, <clears throat> Thoracic out syndrome doesn't affect markedly our course or traversing or navigating the catheter because the average size of the subclavian artery approximately from nine to 12. If compared to 50%, for example, we will have enough space to traverse our catheter and our 
So there is no great impact of our, uh, on our transradial intervention. Second issue that I would like to discuss with you tonight regarding subclavian artery obstruction syndrome is subclavian steel phenomenon. What is a sub subclavian steel phenomenon? In the anatomy, vascular anatomy, abnormal anatomy, we discussed it clearly that the vertebral arteries originate from the first part of the subclavian artery. They course superiorly and posteriorly, and they merge together to form the basilar, basilar artery. Together with both internal carotid arteries, they form the circle of wells, from which the main blood supply of the brain appears. So it is a balanced circulation between both vertebral arteries and both or basilar artery at the end and both internal carotid artery. One can anticipate that when you have left subclavian artery obstruction, proximal segment right here, one can expect that blood flow and pressure will decline markedly. So what will happen? We do expect that reversal of flow from the basilar artery to the epilateral vertebral artery will start to, to refuse or to, dial or to compensate for the hemodynamic support for the upper extremity in the same obstructed visit. This nice picture done at Islamic Center Al Azhar University. So there is a reversal of shunt from the epilateral vertebral artery to compensate. So it steals the blood from the vertebral basilar part. Okay, if this is discovered accidentally and the patient is asymptomatic, it is called subclavian steel phenomenon. But once this reversal of shunt happens and our patient becomes symptomatic, this is called subclavian steel syndrome. So this is the difference, simply difference between subclavian steel syndrome and subclavian steel phenomenon. So what are the major symptoms? We have a constellation of two major symptoms. Symptoms of vertebrobasilar insufficiency and symptoms of upper extreme ischemia. Vertebrobasilar insufficiency usually present in vast majority of situations by dizziness. I can remember so many patients predisposed for subclavian artery, and I referred those patients to ENT colleagues because of dizziness, because I anticipated vestibular causes. But starting from today, any patient who presents with or predisposed for subclavian artery obstruction, Definitely, I will screen for left subclavian artery. So dizziness is the commonest cause of vertebral basilar insufficiency together with ataxia, diplopia, vertigo, syncope. And in very rare situations, those patients come with a stroke, especially if there is subclavian artery dissection. I have one of my dear colleagues in Oman who developed this stroke because of the left vertebral artery dissection. He treated conservatively, and now he's doing very well, alhamdulillah. Uh, the other constellation of symptoms, upper limb, uh, or upper limb uh, ischemia. Usually, those patients come with pain, fatigue, coolness, paresthesia, numbness, and in severe obstruction or total occlusion, severe ischemia, they will come with or will present with trophic changes due to severe obstruction. So, the subclavian steel syndrome as opposed to the subclavian steel phenomenon. Another issue due to obstruction of subclavian artery may come as coronary subclavian steel syndrome. Coronary, what is the coronary subclavian steel syndrome? For better elucidation, I would like to share with you this story of unfortunate young lady, 42 year old, who is known to be diabetic for five years. At age of 38, she experienced anterior segment elevation myocardial infarction. At age of 40, she undergone coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, it was extremely sad because this patient came with no documents at all. Documents lost or whatever, there was no document and the patient coming complaining of recurrent effort in the chest pain with CC, CSS3. Dizziness, left arm pain that I attributed to ischemia and the numbness I attributed to diabetes mellitus. On examination, the radial pulse was good volume and was equal. And the blood pressure was 120 in the right hand, and the left hand was a little bit less, 110 over 70. And with manifestation or ECG and echocardiography, highly suggestive of prior ischemic heart disease. Echocardiography, ejection fraction 40x with radial MR. Okay, based on these issues, so what do you think? What is the best strategy to reach diagnosis and to treat this patient? 
So I am raising this issue for discussion, or shall I continue? Perhaps can I meet yourself? What do you think? Um, I, I would be concerned. I mean, this young lady has an aggressive form of coronary atherosclerosis at a young age. Um, she was uh, she was found to have extensive disease. Now, I don't understand the rationale behind cabbage without knowing the anatomy, but I can only assume that she had extensive triple vessel disease. Um, so we have two options here. One option is to uh, um, send her for a, a cardiac CT. Um, that will allow you to study the graft as well. Um, okay. The other alternative is to do a conventional coronary angiogram, and I think both options are reasonable. Okay, I think my strategy for all these patients, especially if I don't know the anatomy of the uh, or the surgery, the documentation surgery. Usually, I do I send those patients directly to the CT scan. So mm -hmm. I think it's a reasonable issue right now, exactly as you mentioned. And unfortunately, I, the report came as just a single lemma to LED. Together with tight proximal left subclavian artery disease, as you see. Also reported moderate disease in the osteum of the LCX and reported non-dominant small RCA lesion together with, as I mentioned right now, tight proximal focal osteal left subclavian artery disease with hemodynamically significant disease, 75%. Okay, so these are the situation right now, tight subclavian artery, single lima. I have also other, so what is the next step? I think exactly as you mentioned, Dr. Hatem, I have nothing except to do invasive coronary angiography to demonstrate what is going on. So invasive coronary angiography, what do you think? What is the best access for those patients? Dr. Hatem, Dr. Samah, Dr. Ahmed, if you hear us. Uh, yes, yeah, alaikum. Is my voice is clear okay. now? Yeah, it's okay. It's clear. Sorry for inconvenience, like in T data and Zane in Saudi okay. Arabia, no problem. Okay, for this case, I think the access for you is radial. This is my comment. Right or left? Uh, for you, you will go put. No problem. No, but I think I am obligated right now. I have a lima <laughs> right now. Okay. It's okay, for the left side for sure. Yeah. Okay, so for uh, sure, it's the left side, I think it's the most preferred. However, uh, some of our colleagues, they can do it from the right side as well, using a dedicated catheter called uh, Simon's catheter. It is a little bit cumbersome uh, approach to reach the lima from the right side. But in presence of this side, uh, left subcarbon artery stenosis, I think we have nothing except the left radial that I did uh, left radial right now. Notice here, I tried, I started with the right coronary artery. And what's happening right now? Once I engage the right, art, right coronary RCA selectively, what happens? Significant dampening of blood pressure, almost zero. And the patient gets, I think, the ECG changes, significant ECG changes. And anyhow, as you see right now, okay, there is a significant mid segment lesion. And I can see this is the co dominant system. There is BDA, and there are septal perforators, despite the artery, it, it appears small as well. So I non-selectively selected the lima, which is flowing, I think, nicely with symmetry flow. The lima itself appears a little bit small or medium size, uh, with good distal uh, runoff in the LED with good distal anastomosis. So selective cannulation of the left system, I think elucidated right now, it is clear there is a very tight very short or ultra short left mean. There's very tight osteal LCX, very tight osteal LED, and there is very early obtuse marginal branch, medium or small size with osteal lesion as well. I think also it is clear in this picture. So what happened? Selective cannulation or selective injection of the LED identified symmetry flow despite the tight region here. And anti grade perfusion of the distal LED with flow reversal to the lima up to the middle of the chest. Okay. This nice view of the LOA cranial view demonstrating that lima reversal flow up to the level of the subclavian artery. Just look here. This is the lima, this is the lima, this is the lima, which heals the blood from the LED. 
to go to the subclavian, left subclavian artery. Here, okay, there is a stealing of blood, stealing of blood from the lima, through the, from the LED to the lima, to the subclav left subclavian artery beyond the spinal segment, resulting in coronary ischemia. Usually those patients present with chest pain, heart failure, life-threatening arrhythmias, even they may present with sudden cardiac death. So there are many review, uh, literature review about the coronary subclavian steel syndrome and how to manage, how to diagnose. I think we are going step by step to them right now. So just from practical point of view, when a patient comes with a chest pain post cabbage, the most logic issue I think to have to think in progression of a native vessel coronary atherosclerosis, physiologic, or non-grafted diseased vessel like our patient right now and graft failure, either early or late. But I think, please, starting from tonight, you have to consider coronary subclavian steel syndrome as an option or possibility for post cabbage chest pain. So what is the coronary subclavian steel syndrome? The etiology reported in the literature, epsilateral subclavian artery stenosis site, hemodynamically significant lesion or total occlusion, or in AV fistula, hemodynamically or hemodialysis was left arterio venous fistula for hemodialysis. The commonest cause for epsilateral or subclavian artery stenosis is atherosclerosis by far, approximately 90%. However, tachyacyl arthritis and radiation arthritis have been mentioned in literature. I was interested when I read in literature, coronary subclavian steel syndrome happens in approximately 4% of all our patients. And usually, may happen after two years, from two years to 31 years after cabbage, but it may happen earlier if missed subclavian artery before surgery, like our patient as well. So it can be diagnosed by invasive coronary angiography. When you see reversal of flow from Lima to the LED to the left subclavian artery. So back to our patient right now. These are my diagnoses right now, working diagnoses, or working diagnosis, sorry tight proximal LED lesion with lima, tight osteal dominant or co-dominant LECX with no graft, tight mid small medium size right coronary artery, tight osteal left subclavian artery stenosis with a patent lima and coronary subclavian steel syndrome. So what do you think? Farhatin, Turja, Sameh, Rahman. Dr. Ahmed, what do you think? It's a complex situation and, and I don't think there's one um, correct answer. I don't think there's a right or wrong, but I'd be interested to know what your approach would be in this case. Okay, Dr. Sameh, are you in gas? Okay, so my approach, my rationale, to be frank with you right now, the patient is having severe angina, even angina at rest. The patient is on table right now. And there is your body of the myocardium at the level of the LCX, which appeared a very large vessel. So what in my hand right now to do is to do LCX right now. RCA, I think that a question mark about its size, is it, does it really require intervention or not? But definitely LCX considered to be the main target for me right now. Left subclavian artery stenosis, despite there is stenosis, but the LED itself, it flows, there is semi-free flow even anti-grade flow, TEMI3 flow. So I think my approach was to go to LCX and also I went from the same left uh, radial approach. So I went to the LCX, ultra short left mean. I think pre-dilatation is uh, mandatory for those lesions. The direct stent I think is discouraged completely. Uh, okay, so I used the 3.5 stent based uh, on the uh, distal diameter of the uh, LCX. Okay, so precisely deployed okay from the or centered and deployed precisely from the ostium of the left mean to the distal lcx okay and dilated okay also i think a good flow in the distal i think it becomes well perfused right now okay so post dilated by a larger size high pressure balloon at 24 this is four balloon so i think the left mean is very very short which is compatible with the size of the LCX itself. 
What I am doing here is just to look here right now. I dilated, was dilated to the stent, and look for my guide cutter. My guide cutter right now is almost at the edge of the stent. I do expect here stent deformity or longitudinal, longitudinal deformity of the stent. So almost almost my practice in osteal lesions, what I am doing. I am doing, this is the last injection for me, or last selective injection. Usually I take another flaring up, I, the catheter is out of the stent right now, flaring up of the ostium, and the last injection, usually I inject in the cusp itself without touching the stent to avoid longitudinal deformation of the stent. So I got satisfactory results regarding the LCX. One month later, I saw the patient, and she exactly mentioned that I have improved only 50%. 50% improvement after the LCX uh, BCI. So what is the next step? I think left subclavian artery recanalization is mandatory for, the for those patients to prevent or to, to stop the stealing of blood from the myocardium through the limb itself. So subclavian artery stenosis, I think this is our subject to today. It's etiology by far atherosclerosis, however, takayasu, arthritis, uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, radiation, uh, radiotherapy, uh, TOS, and the neurofibromatosis all have been described, but by far atherosclerosis. And when ha we have patients like this with uh, atherosclerosis, usually they share the same risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, and other uh, risk factors for atherosclerosis like any domain. Uh, we reported as well, this is our patient, a 46 male patient presented with stochastic arthritis, presented with ascending aorta aneurysm, as you see right now, with the three, the ostia of the three major vessels all affected by different grades of osteolysis. Moreover, those patients, this the same patient came with severe left and right osteal renal artery stenosis. Not only that, also the celiac trunk and severe mesenteric artery, severe lesions. So tachyacid arthritis also should be considered for some of our group of patients. Subclavian artery stenosis, its incidence, okay, in general population, approximately one to 2%, is reported to be in the left more than right, three to, three to four times. Usually it is a focal lesion, and usually in the proximal, it doesn't affect the mid or distal segment. Uh, in another study, subclavian artery disease prevalence in angiographic studies, it was 3.5% in patients going to the cardiac cath lab, either normal or abnormal or just the general. For those patients referred for cabbage, it was approximately 7%, and you cannot believe. In patients with documented peripheral arterial disease reported in one fifth of the patients. So it's a highly prevalent disease that we have to consider for any patients we are referring for cabbage. Subclavian artery stenosis, how can we diagnose or anticipate from the clinical point of view? Usually for severe subclavian artery stenosis, we do expect unilateral weak pulse and the blood pressure difference more than 20 millimeter mercury in the arm with normal subclavian artery. However, Sometimes bilateral subclavian artery stenosis is reported, so we cannot rely 100% about such measurements. Suprasternal bruit, because I mentioned that the subclavian artery appears from superior thoracic aperture, which is suprasternal notch. So we have to listen for any bruit or anticipated bruit. Uh, duplex scan, I think, it plays a very, very important role in such situation. Uh, CT scan, as we a uh, nice image that we uh, presented right now, MRE also plays a very, very important role. During coronary angiography, we can inject and document the subclavian artery stenosis. What are the indications for subclavian artery stenosis? I have seen all symptomatic patients, I think, we can recanalize. Uh, symptoms of posterior circulation of subfaciences that we mentioned, especially dizziness. Uh, upper extremity ischemia, like this may induce pain or coronary uh, subclavian steel syndrome. All these require recanalization or revascularization of subclavian artery. This can be done either by PTA or surgery. This patient, okay, with the balloon dilatation with nice stent deployment and surgery either by carotid subclavian bypass or aorto subclavian bypass. 
Okay, I think they reported very nice surgeons. They reported very nice results with carotid subclavian still subclavian uh, bypass, carotid subclavian bypass, which considered to be another, yani, uh, another steal as well. But they report a good uh, follow up with those patients. So I would like to conclude not only this session but the subclavian segment as well because I found it very very interesting segment, very impressive segment that. Any interventional radio, intervention cardiologist doing transradial intervention should be aware about. So subclavian artery origin, the left differs from the right. From the right, it appears or by for, or the one of the branches of the innominate artery, while the left originates directly from the aortic arch. Uh, working from the left radial artery, usually it is easier and safer because of the subclavian segment, only subclavian, not related to the left or radial, or right or left radial artery, but only because of this subclavian segment, the left is easier and safer. Why easier? Okay, because in the left, it is less resistant points, less arterial surya, less loops, less torsuatsky, and the way safer will mention right now. Why, how many resistant bones that we, we, make, we may meet while working from the left, only one. If you have left subclavian artery tertiary at the junction with the arch, this is only one resistant point. While working from the right, we may have two. One at the bifurcation of the innominate and one of the innominate arch junction. If there is any tertiary here, usually we will face resistance. By a report, I reported a unique case. This is the, uh, my case that I reported here. Three resistant points rather than two, which this situation is called the bovine arch, in which the, there is a common trunk that gives rise to left common carotid artery and the nominate artery. So we have three points right now of resistance. One at the bifurcation of the nominate, one as of the bifurcation of the common trunk with the left common uh, carotid, and one of this common trunk with the arch. So all these, I think, resistant points, making the left, left more easier. Arterial zoria, I think also working from the left, it will be easier. However, in the last session, we demonstrated how to overcome arterial zoria and to make it easy. We have to recognize first in which your wire will preferentially uh, goes to the descending aorta rather, rather, than the descend, rather than ascending aorta. We have to document by withdrawal and injecting contrast. You will demonstrate the origin for origin of the right subclavian artery from from the uh, descending from the descending aorta, we demonstrated easy how to overcome and traverse your catheter from the descending aorta to the ascending aorta. How to engage from the arterial zoria, the left and the right coronary. I think we have highlighted and reviewed in a single or a single session for that. I reported loops in the right subclavian artery, but I didn't report a single loop in the left subclavian artery, making it easier from the left rather than uh, right. Also, the uh, subclavian artery tertiary is reported in both right and the left uh, subclavian artery. But reported in literature, these tertiary the, are twice in the right as compared to the left. And in octogenarians, usually five times tertiary are encountered in the right subclavian artery as compared to the left side. So in octogenarians, please, if you are going to do one patient more than 80 years, his age or her age more than 80 years, start from the left uh, directly. Many complications may happen from the uh, tortuosities like dissection. Usually that happened right. This patient happened with me in the left, but usually the complications happen right. And we encountered our in in literature more aggressive complications from right as compared or as opposed to the left. Uh, Torsuatsis may result in significant catheter kink or sometimes a complete knot. And how to prevent and how to release such a knot? I think it was amazing the presentation how to prevent and how to release such a knot. Uh, lastly, but not leastly, subclavian artery obstruction syndrome that we have to consider and have to put in our mind thoracic outlet syndrome, subclavian steel phenomena, subclavian steel syndrome, as well as coronary subclavian steel syndrome. So please, for any patient before cabbage, starting from tonight, I think we have to prove or exclude subclavian artery stenosis. I think it's worse to do that. You can expect from clinical examination, blood pressure in both arms difference more than 20, where we in the suprasternal joint due to 
subclavian artery stenosis, especially in the proximal segment, or associated peripheral arterial disease. One fifth of those patients will have subclavian artery stenosis. Duplex scan is the easiest and the cost effective way CT scan, MRE, and angiography to confirm cardiac subclavian steel syndrome. Understanding vascular anatomy for the radial pathway and its in particular awareness of the common variations is very, very important for any radialist aiming at increasing success, reducing crossover rate to other routes, and recognition and managing complications. And I finish. Thank you so much, Prof. Mansour. So um, shall we perhaps take a couple of questions for the next couple of minutes before Prof. Ahmed's uh, session? We have um, one of our attendees asking you, Prof. Mansour, uh, for the case you presented, would you have considered opening the uh, native LAD rather than performing PCI to the left subclavian artery uh, in order to tackle the uh, coronary subclavian steel syndrome? Subclavian steel syndrome, I think there is the drawback is the lima is stealing, stealing blood from the lead LED to the left subclavian artery. So opening of the LED itself will not solve the problem. Already, despite it appears a tight lesion in the osteal LED or proximal LED, however, there is semi three flow. This is first. To solve the problem of steel syndrome, we have to recanalize subclavian artery rather than to open the LED. So LED will not solve the problem. I would like to keep lima itself. Once we recanalize subclavian artery, I do expect that blood flow and the pressure will increase in the subclavian artery. This in other way will increase blood and blood flow and the pressure in the lima. So definitely lima flow will be better than the LED flow for, I, I think, for the durability. We are planning to do uh, PTA or uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, uh, sorry, percutaneous uh, transluminal uh, revascularization of subclavian artery first, and we will see what is going on. But LED is well perfused. And the main issue right now, I would like to stop the stealing of blood from the myocardial circulation, from the LED to Lima to the uh, subclavian artery. So this is our aim in the next step right now, and we will reassess ourselves. Thank you. Hmm. All right, I don't have any more questions. I have, um... okay, I think we'll uh, invite uh, Professor Ahmed Neda to give us his talk. It's okay, uh, Salaam Alaikum. Now it's clear, I, I think? It is. Okay. Share your screen, uh, I'm sharing now my screen. Is it? Yeah, I shared it already. Is it clear for you? We see yeah. your slide now, Prof. Ahmed. Yeah, it's okay. Perfect. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Samah Alam, Prof. Mansour Salam for, for, for this, I think, prestigious course, which I'm expecting to expand more and more to become, I think, most one of the most important in the field. Uh, and I'm extending my thanking to you, Dr. Hatim, for your amazing presentation regarding the complication of catheter kinking and how to manage everything with reviewing all the articles. So first of all, uh, I thank all of you for this and for sharing session. Uh, I move to my, uh, my, my talk. Okay, so I shared this uh, photo with Satoru Sumatsuji Sensei, this is one of the world lead uh, CTO operators. And beside him, actually, uh, my friend, uh, I, 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 I get a laser, it's okay. My friend, Patrick Sigerist, he's the head of cat lab in uh, Heart Center University in Zurich in Switzerland. And that, that, that was actually during my training in CTO for uh, anti-grade and retrograde. And I aim from this image just to show that actually not all the interventions are the same. And we all know that dealing with a CTO lesion differs completely from dealing with acute situations. So this is one of the most important messages. Uh, I think the course and all of us want to deliver it. And uh, please let me uh, share the messages I got from Japan regarding the, the, the operators and, the, and the, our colleagues. First of all, first message, actually just to be meticulous, Second message, please look at everything and ask about everything. 
Third message, please don't take others' opinion as fixed facts. And the last message, by learning, by training, by discussion with colleagues, with seniors, you have to make your own opinion and your own approach. This is one of the most important things. This is illustration from the uh, 2017 uh, ESC guidelines. And I think we have some problems in our area uh, in the Middle East regarding uh, some issues uh, correlated to patient delay as most of the patient came a little bit late to us due to many uh, issues, cultural or financial. And we have a problem with the EMS delay uh, regarding uh, transmission and dispatch of the patients. And came to the last point, which is transferring the patient either to PCI capable or PCI non capable centers. And this is one of the most important thing that may affect patient lives and patient prognosis. And also from the EC guidelines, actually, we saw some changes when comparing the uh, 2012 guidelines to 2017 guidelines and uh, came in the top that radial access upgraded from class 2A to class one. And that was based on the matrix trial. And matrix actually is considered a program. As we all know that actually it was uh, conducted in uh, four countries, uh, over 78 centers. And the, the, the aim of that to compare femoral versus radial beside comparing bivalerodine to unfractionated heparin. And the results actually came at that time uh, equal without any uh, statistical significant difference regarding the MACE. And at that time, we heard about the NACE, which is the net clinical adverse outcomes, and it came in favor of radial uh, axis. And since that time, radial axis is considered the primary axis and the main axis for all cases coming with acute coronary syndrome, especially STEMI patients. For sake of time and for the instructions from Dr. Mansour, I'll skip the first case and I'll move to the second case. Okay, so this is a 34 years old male. Actually, he's a military guy. He's a, a military major. Uh, he came in eight days. And as we know all that eight days in our countries are a little bit different. Uh, at such age, we have done 18 primary uh, cases during three days of eight. Uh, and five of them were left main occlusion. Uh, and he was one of these uh, left main occlusion at that time. Uh, he has multiple risk factors. He has heavy smoker, diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, positive family history of ischemic heart disease. And the relatives told me at that time uh, that he has history of coronary angio with PCI, but actually there is no report to localize. But we realized after that where was the, the PCI. He came early in the morning, in the second day of eight. At that day, actually, I went back in 3 a.m. finishing a primary PCI, and they awakened me in the morning around 6.30 regarding this case. The ECG showed at that time ST segment elevation in leads one and AVL. And as we all know that we expected that there is occlusion either in diagonal or M, Remus or whatever. And during coming to the hospital, they called me back and they told me that the patient actually arrested. I was thinking, what's the reason uh, of a patient which is young, whatever the comorbidities, to, to be arrested with high lateral STEMI? And when I reached the hospital, the patient already developed acute pulmonary edema, and he was arrested with ventricular fibrillation. As usual, CPR, DC shock successfully done, and he was mechanically ventilated. He uh, regained ROSC with inotropic support, and he was shifted immediately to cat lab for life-saving procedure. And just to intensify one of the most important points, which is talking to the relatives during transferring the patients. As I, as I mentioned a few minutes back that he, he's a military guy. So uh, they asked me if they can transfer him to the military hostel or whatever. The answer came that he has a critical situation. His heart already arrested many times. So there is no frame for that. And thanks to God, actually, I, I found one of the wise brothers to him because he has already a big family that realized the criticality of the situation. 
Anyhow, we shifted him to the cat lab and that was his coronary angio. Coming to the main point, uh, we started as usual, as Dr. Mansour is doing in his 100% of cases, to do radial. But again, this is one of the messages we, I think we need to deliver in, in, in that course that as mentioned by Prof. Sameh Allah, the golden rule. Again, we are here to learn and to teach radial approach, but it's not necessity and not mandatory to use it all the time. We have to uh, actually verify it and make it according to the situation. And that patient, post arrest, hypotensive, critical situation, so we don't have leisure of time to wait to try to puncture again. We tried actually to raise the inotropic support. We tried to give policies of fluids just to increase the volume of blood, try to puncture the radial, but we failed. So at that time, it's okay, there's a time for radial, and we thought that he may need intraortic balloon or whatever, so it's okay to go in that approach. This is the right, and you appreciate that there is retrograde collaterals coming to the left system while the right system has no significant lesions. So please, waiting for your decision. I want to share knowledge with you, please. Dr. Hatem. Uh, I would put a wire down that uh... <laughs> occluded left main and wherever that wire lands. Yeah. Um, the, the idea here is to try and abort the infarct, uh, which is causing a lot of hemodynamic and electrical instability. So cross with the wire, wherever the wire lands, balloon, um, establish flow, whatever the flow might be, but at least some flow, and then take another angiogram and assess the situation and take it from there. Perfect. Dr. Mansour. Exactly, I think the same, whatever. Okay, let the wire go anyway. Just open the flow immediately, please. Okay, uh, I don't know if Prof. Samah is around or not. It's okay. So just for brainstorming, why do you think that patient coming with ST segment elevation in one and AVL considered high lateral STEMI to present with such situation? If you, do you have any explanation, Dr. Mansour? Now, something amazing, to be frank with you, I was surprised that left main is totally occluded with such a description of ECG that you said right now. I did expect that diffuse segment elevation uh, in one EVL from V1 to V6, but just uh, one and EVL, I think uh, I have no explanation right now. Dr. Hatem. Um, I, I honestly don't have a clear-cut explanation um, for why the ST elevations were localized to the high lateral leads. Uh, and, and I must have missed this point, but was there any ST elevation in AVR and V1? No, it's actually diffused ST segment uh, depression in the other leads, but only elevation in one AVL. Okay, so in this situation, uh, Dr. Ahmed, I think uh, the winter sign, I think maybe I wish that you presented the ECG. So the winter entails that a segment depression with uh, hyperacuity wave. I think it could be this situation right now. I, 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 I realize what you mentioned, actually, it was not the winter, it's not well and it's not nothing. It's only a segment depression. The main remarking issue that there is elevation in the one and every elites. And even if there is retrograde collaterals, I think it will be not suffi sufficient enough just to make this uh, any one AVL. Uh, I have no explanation. I have no explanation. Okay, I, I'll be happy to share knowledge with our colleagues. But what what I thought at that time that the STEMI started in the uh, branch, which we'll see later, and it propagated retrogradely to occlude the left main. That was my thinking at that time, uh, because again, it's another window. We don't have any any explanation for this. So we all agree that we have to pass fire and to see what will be next, right? Okay. So already we passed two wires and one wire went smooth to the LED. I tried to cannulate the circuit, but it was very difficult, but the wire slipped actually to Ramos. So whatever, as we uh, already secure two wires in place. So this is a good situation and a good step. Uh, at that time, uh, I pass a small balloon 
two millimeter balloon as 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 seen in the left, just to clear the vessel. And already we uh, open the the balloon at low pressure. Always we are doing in 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 primary that opening the balloon uh, at low pressure, either six to eight millimeter uh, 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 atmospheres. And after that, I did aspiration, hoping to clarify the situation. And that was the situation after doing balloon at low pressure and after doing some suction. Uh, in this view, you appreciate that there is, we don't know, filling defect in the left main. It is a lesion, it is a thrombus. We don't know, we don't have any idea at that time. And this is the LED and we see all the shadow of the old stents in mid LED. And uh, as we saw later that the wire actually went to the ramus. And because of the difficult angle, it failed to go to the cell. For sure, we ignore it. It's, it's, it's not our concern. So, okay. We did subsequent, uh, we did already actually uh, some aspiration uh, and subsequent injection showed that there is again no flow. Despite we didn't manipulate too much, it's only a uh, two millimeter balloon at low pressure. We upgraded to a three millimeter balloon at low pressure again. We did some aspiration. So no flow after getting, I'll come back again, please, after getting this issue. So what will be the next, next step? Dr. Hatem. Wow, that's a difficult situation here. So we weren't able to restore flow using mechanical measures. So um, um, one would wonder if you would use a more aggressive uh, um, uh, modalities of thrombectomy, um, like rheolytic thrombectomy or angiojet, uh, with more okay. aggressive uh, um, thrombus disintegration. Um, uh, the use of uh, uh, um, antiplatelet drugs intracoronary might be a consideration. So uh, the use right. of glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, or with okay. such extensive thrombus burden, I don't know what a cranial view would show you, but um, you, you almost wonder whether the problem started with acute stem thrombosis in that LED with propagated very quickly back to the left main, um, in which case you anticipate a lot of thrombus and in certain situations when you're desperate, consideration could be given for intracoronary thrombolytic therapy. Okay. Dr. Mansour. No, I think uh, despite the blood pressure is expected to be low, but I would like to use a small dose of nitroglycerin substitution. Sometimes I can give intracoronary uh, norepinephrine, a small uh, dose or recommended dose. Uh, exactly as Dr. Hatem mentioned, I will use the glycoprotein to be a receptor antagonist, but I will never use the uh, thrombolytic therapy here in such a situation. So I think this is in my hand. Uh, after that, I think I can stent from the left main to this uh, large vessel uh, and to establish flow. Or, uh, hey, flow which large vessel you see? Uh, this is an ramus intermediate that appears, but I would like to see also in a different view, a yani cranial view, just to see what is the LED, okay, what is the situation. Because I would like, first, definitely, I will stent from the left main to LED direct. Okay, uh, another comment, Dr. Hatem. Um, I, I would be thinking um, twice about placing a stent at this stage in time because, um, I mean, you could you could potentially uh, establish flow in the proximal conduit in the left main and the prox LAD, but um, you have no idea what would happen once a stent is implanted. You could embolize downstream. You could cause severe no reflow, um, not only in the LAD but also in the ongoing ramus and the circumflex, and end up with. Um, 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 uh, a dire situation, equally equally difficult situation. So um, I would hesitate to place a stent before I see better flow, um, either with uh, more pharmacology. I mean, you could, you could consider giving um, uh, intracoronary um, um, adenosine or a little bit of nitroglycerin or epinephrine intracoronary. And if it becomes hypotensive, then you can chase it with a li little bit of phenylephrine to support the perfusing pressures. But uh, um, I mean, from my limited experience, I, I wouldn't rush the stenting yet. I'd like to see better flow. Okay, perfect. So uh, coming to the mention point, actually the patient was hypotensive. 
So we have a limited window to use any validators for whatever the, 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 the types. So it's not in our era. We try to use the 2P3 inhibitor uh, injection. We, we inject all the loading inside. Uh, the problem that using uh, thrombectomy, as mentioned by Dr. Hatim, that during uh, manipulation, we realize that there is a tight lesion. And again, I'll point it here, that what we see here, actually, it's a tight lesion in the left main. It's not a thrombus. And we realize this by using a, a, a larger balloon, which was the three millimeter balloon. And we, fa we found actually there is a waste on that balloon. So uh, I'm not encouraged just to, to push whatever through this lesion, despite I tried to dilate it many times. So at that time, I came to review the angio, and I realized that all the vessels are diffusely diseased. And this is the typical nature coming back to the history is diabetic patients. And I can't go through every single vessel to dilate it up to the apex. This is not logic in such situation. Regarding the point, if the thrombus actually accumulated first in the middle ED and coming retrogradely to the left main, uh, it, it, it's not supported because of the ECG. The ECG again came with one and every O. So the thinking that it may start at Remus or whatever and coming back, not the LED itself. That was the thinking regarding the, the, the plan. At that moment, I was exhausted by all the means to, to restore flow. And I reviewed the angio in different projections, as you mentioned. And this is the best projection to verify the uh, trifurcation and the, the whole lens of the left main. I was lucky to see that the left main actually is considered long. It's more than 20 millimeter. And I want to show you that we have I thought at that time that we have a landing zone just before the trifurcation. So I not jeopardize any other vessels. I not put a stent in a vessel, which I don't know the diameter. I not put a stent across the other vessels and making maybe more complications without any reason. So the plan at that time, just to bring a stent and to localize it exactly like we see here just before the trifurcation. And we inflated the uh, stained balloon and you appreciate the waste, the tight waste actually on the distal part uh, of the stent. The stent was uh, for uh, pi 18. And as I mentioned, actually it was exactly uh, at the carina just before the, the trifurcation. And that was the situation after deploying the stent. We restore flow and before restoring flow, Actually, patient was ventilated, but the blood pressure jumped dramatically from 80 to 150, exactly at that moment after opening the vessel. So you appreciate that there is haziness all through the vessels in the LED, in the ramus mainly, and you see that there is apical embolization. There is a thrombus displaced apically in the LED itself. So, next up, Dr. Hatim. Um, to be very honest, now that you've restored flow uh, into the left Perfect. coronary system and secured right. the main vessel, your patient right. is now hemodynamically stable. Right. Um, I would actually consider stopping here um, right. aggressively treating the patient with um, heparin and perhaps even glycoprotein 2 b 3 inhibitors and relook him in 48 hours. Perfect. Dr. Mansour. The entire LAD is disease slash full of thrombus. Um, and an additional manipulation there could, uh, could compromise the flow that you've achieved with further embolization and uh, uh, slower flow in the LAD and might make the situation worse. So um, that would be that would be my, my approach here. Perfect, Dr. Mansour. I think I do agree with this strategy right now, just to stop here. And we have almost TME2 to TME3 flow. The patient is okay. dynamically stable. Okay, so I think I will put this patient on uh, glycoprotein 2B3 receptor antagonist 
for 18 or 24 hours and reassess the patient. Or if the patient collapses or blood pressure hemodynamically becomes decompensated, I will take the patient and I will recognize LED uh, because almost all of them respecting the LED. So conservative strategy, I think it's uh, warrant here in this situation. Okay, perfect. Uh, before moving to the next slide, uh, do you appreciate the epicranial view that you asked before? Yes. It's okay, the stent exactly just before the trifurcation, as you see here, yes. and the, all the vessels are coming up, okay? okay. So exactly like what mentioned, uh, that as hemodynamics improved, so this is the time to calm down, shift the patient to CCU and to continue the medical therapy. We, st we, we continue the 2P3 inhibitors, as mentioned exactly for 48 hours. Uh, and luckily the patient regained his consciousness completely, despite a little, a little bit long uh, CPR in, 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 in the ER. And he was successfully uh, weaned from mechanical ventilation and even from inotropic support in the same day. Uh, I think it was within 12 hours after the procedure. Uh, luckily, he was neurologically intact. He was fully conscious, flat, comfortable, and completely asymptomatic. And the echo revealed that there is impaired LV systolic function. Ejection fraction was uh, 20%, with regional motion abnormality in, 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 in all forms, echinesia, hypokinesia, and for sure it was in the territory of, uh, of, of the anterior and uh, lateral vessels. So, we brought him back uh, to the cat lab after uh, 48 hours. And as usual, as Dr. Mansour is doing in his life, that we did it transradial. We have a stable patient. We don't have any, any, any problem to rush uh, uh, for that. And as you see that exactly there is TMA3 flow. And you appreciate that even the embolization, the implied thrombus in the previous procedure actually cleared 100%. And now we clarify and we verified all the diffuse lesions in the LED and in the ramus. So again, this is the epicranial, this is the iliocranial view, just to verify that there is diffuse disease in the LED and in the ramus. And you appreciate that when we did the right coronary injection, there is no more contralaterals coming to the left side. That means that the anti-grade perfusion to the left system is quite enough. Decision, Dr. Hatem. Oh, um, uh, one thing I definitely do before deciding on further revask is I'd like to interrogate the stented segment with intravascular imaging. Um, okay. in the, uh, in the cranial view, uh, the mid segment of the left main appears underexpanded, and that's not uncommon in an acute uh, vasoconstricted state uh, with increased tone. Um, the vessels tend to appear smaller than, than they usually are. So the first thing I do is uh, pass the IFAS catheter or OCT catheter down the LAD, interrogate from mid segment, and then focus on the left main stent and um, um, decide if that stent needs to be further optimized. And then um, boils back to the question whether you want to um, uh, re re finish the work with uh, more stents or um, I, I forget if this patient was diabetic or not, um, consider diabetic, surgical yeah. reasons. Diabetic and young guy, yeah. Dr. Mansour. So, so diabetic young guy, I mean, the diabetes would be a deter, uh, something that will push you towards bypass surgery, but then by, this, by, the, by, the, by the young age, uh, and the fact that if you stent him, uh, uh, the, stent, the segments that you're going to stent are not going to compromise his future bypass targets, that would still be a reasonable option. Albeit Dr. very long, small okay. stents. Okay. okay, so it depends, uh, uh, for me, it depends upon uh, where uh, I am treating this patient, either my cat lab where there's IVAS is not available or in a fully equipped cat lab. So if okay. I am uh, in a fully equipped cat lab, definitely intravascular ultrasound will help us to take a proper decision. But if I am treating in my cat lab, I will send from the almost distal LED. 
small stent 2.5 and I will upgrade if required and I will go up because I think differently. I will for I will use 4.5 or at least or even five uh, uh, millimeter balloon to uh, both the elliptomy. Uh, I think it may be sufficient for the time being in acute situation and I can assess the patient after that after three months or at or even by the symptomatic assessment if required. So I think almost all of as I told you that I do respect the LED. So I would like to recanalize LED completely and I think it will regain the myocardial perfusion uh, and, yeah, mostly. Okay, uh, first, uh, first point, actually you don't have IVAS uh, at that facility. Okay. The second point I want to clarify. Again, back to the presentation, the patient came already with a uh, high lateral STEMI. So okay. uh, we thought actually that the ramus is the culprit. So all of us are talking about the LED. What about the ramus? It's a good size, actually supplying a big territory and it has multiple proximal and mid lesions. Okay. In actual fact, if you look carefully for the uh, ramus itself, yes, exactly as you said, approximately 2.5, 2.75, but just look for the terminal end of the uh, vessel. It is a diffusely diseased with a tight lesion. So you will open it proximally, but I think distally, I think it will not be appropriate uh, for me. So I would like to treat it conservatively right now. So LED is LED, I think it will be sufficient for the myocardium. But uh, because of the diffuse nature of the disease, especially in the distal, uh, I think I will treat it conservatively, Dr. Hatem. Dr. Hatem. Um. I, 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 I would be actually inclined to, um, to treat the ramus. Um, the, the, the question would be um, how, and, and then, then we can always discuss the technical aspects, but I would, I would uh, treat the ramus. I think it's a, it's a decent sized vessel. I agree that it's uh, quite diseased and the uh, diseased segment is quite long, extending from the ostium to the uh, proximal and perhaps segment. The segment. But um, yeah. In my opinion, it will it will take a, it will take at least a two to five stent. Um, there are there is a lot of movement towards using drug coated balloons um, in vessels less than two point five millimeters in diameter. So that would be one consideration. Um, Perfect. Particularly if you get a good POVA result uh, without uh, significant flow limiting dissection. So that would be another option. But I would treat the ramus as well. Okay. Perfect. So we conclude that actually there is remaining lesions uh, needs to be revascularized by whatever the means. Uh, coming again to the presentation, patient, as mentioned, is diabetic. He has history of ischemic heart disease. He did PCI to the middle LED, which clearly it's restenosed in that angio. So thinking about putting at least, at least four or five more stents so we are multiplying the risk of free stenosis maybe by 10 or, or, or more. So at that moment, we thought that this is enough for the patient. We succeed to save his life. And we have to think in, in the other way. We calculated actually the syntax score for him. And it's clear it's 41.5. And the syntax 2 score uh, actually came with higher mortality. Uh, in case of PCI, if compared uh, to cabbage. So the, the, the decision with the multidisciplinary team uh, was to proceed for cabbage after viability. Actually, the, the, as, 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 as we mentioned, that the echo showed ejection fraction of 20% and all the territory of the anterior and lateral was affected. So no rush to go. We have time to study the case well, and we have to stop at that time. So the patient actually was kept in the CCU for two days only and one more day in, in, in the ward. And uh, he was discharged coming uh, to my clinic wearing top, wearing a cap actually, which directed backwards, wearing his Adidas and moving freely. And we followed up him actually in one, two and four weeks. And he, he was completely, completely asymptomatic. So I, I, I'll go a little bit to review the literature regarding, regarding the acute uh, occlusion of the left main. Uh, this is article was published in the PubMed in uh, 2018 uh, by uh, my friend uh, Zoltan Rusha. I went to him actually uh, in Semmelweis University in Hungary. 
Uh, he's one, one, one of the brilliant operators. He's working so hard, he's doing everything. And actually he, he was the one to taught me and to push me to start doing the transradial. That was uh, in 2017. And uh, that uh, article actually uh, was, uh, was mentioning that there was a study over 23 patients uh, they reviewed them, uh, came actually with uh, acute left main occlusion. Uh, uh, they, they, around 85% of, uh, of them actually has a cardiogenic shock. And they reported that the in-hospital mortality was around 56%. And the, the, the six months mace coming down to 8.7. And another registry, uh, uh, called uh, Atolma, which is Acute Total Occlusion of Left Main Artery. Uh, it was published this year in July. Uh, and the conclusion actually showed that the independent predictor of in-hospital mortality was exactly the post-procedural TEMI flow. And that was the most important marker to decide uh, the prognosis uh, for those patients, despite having higher mortality, but achieving a good and uh, a well TEMI flow, I think it, it, it was enough for that. I posted these images just to mention two situations. On the left side, we have what's called the less expert operators, wearing their shorts, playing on a wet floor, and they don't care. And the expectation for that, that actually they will have a catastrophic outcome, mostly. But sometimes they have a good luck uh, and the best of luck to pass this uh, safely without any problem. And on the right side, this is a little bit more expert, which when they see the sign of wet floor wearing their uh, formal suite, they are trying to move a little bit wisely. But despite all of this, they uh, are exposed to fall at any time. So please, the message that minimize walking on wet floor, whenever, wherever there is a thrombus, be cautious and try to minimize the time in your procedure. My take home message that life-saving primary PCI is crucial and, and guidelines and all of us agree for that. And treating infarcted artery is recommended by guidelines and it's mandatory for sure. For sure, the multidisciplinary team approach is essential in decision-making, but after stabilizing the case. And please to remember this, treating lesion is good, but treating patient is perfect. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Prof. Ahmed. That was a wonderful um, interactive session. Um, let me Thanks see if we have questions from the audience. Prof. Please. Mansour, do you have any questions? I think it was exactly as you mentioned, it's perfect session, perfect case, the perfect discussion. Also from all our audience, I just, I am following with them right now. I think uh, brilliant answers given by all our attendees right now. They shared to us the same, almost the same thoughts. However, despite this case is not a straightforward case, and also I think the, our opinions were different, and all these opinions I think should be respected. Uh, but what is the right answer? I think no right answer right now, no single answer. What we, uh, right. I think, what we said right now, I think, uh, lastly, the patient is doing fine and is our uh, target and our, I think, uh, job to do. Uh, perfect done, Dr. Ahmed. I think it's a very, very nice case uh, scenario. Dr. Hassi. The simple, uh, the simple comment for that, sorry, sorry for interruption. The simple comment for that, actually, we, we, we are following the patient. And now uh, this is the third year for him. He's doing fine. Uh, he's completely stable without any problem. Uh, and despite many puzzles during the procedure, I think all the puzzles leads to many messages we need to deliver during the management and coming back to the title, STEMI way of thinking. Always in STEMI patients try to hit and run. Hit wisely and run wisely. Think about your case, think about the, back, the background. If you have any clues that help you to manage the patient properly, quickly, I think it will be the proper choice. If not, think about how to stabilize the patient, how to open the infarcted artery and let the scenario to move later. But trying to fix everything at the same time, I think it will be catastrophic. 
Dr. Ahmed, uh, there is a one question from your uh, beloved uh, colleague uh, and our my beloved colleague as well, Dr. Mustafa Mkarrab. He's asking you, uh, you didn't uh, give an answer. <laughs> okay. You didn't give an, us an answer. Why is stigma elevation was elevated in one in the AVL? Okay, this is actually uh, the discussed issue. And this is the most, I think, the most, the most accepted theory for that. That again, uh, the patient presented with STEMI in the Ramos territory and the thrombus propagated retrograde. And because of the tight lesion in the uh, distal left main, we, we, we approximately calculated the, the left main lesion to be around 80% or more. So it's a thrombus propagated retrograde and blocked the, the left main. This is, this is our explanation. I don't know if he, if he has any explanation or that, but actually that case, I, 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 I uh, presented this in, in the States, in the TCT, and uh, most of the guys actually didn't find any answer for this, rather than what I mentioned. Okay, so in cardiogenic shock, I think as you are aware, the electricity, and I think it will be uh, markedly less as compared to the active myocardium. So I think this uh, case scenario has started by exactly as you mentioned, uh, uh, Ray Ray or diagonal or whatever, yes. then because of the metabolic activity, it was markedly declined. The electric activity of ECG was almost not you know, active. So I think this made the S segment just persisted as a one and the AVL. That's it. Uh, but I think the left mean is left mean, LED is LED. And, uh, all threats are included with the left mean. So uh, anyhow, I think it does not matter right now whether the one AVL or whatever, but the matter is restoring the T3 flow. Right. Uh, again, as I mentioned, actually the patient went into arrest for around uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and I think at that time, there is no, no plan, no chance to repeat the ECG, to do whatever uh, or, or what's called serial ECG for that patient. So we depend uh, actually on the presenting ECG. Maybe, the, maybe there is other ECG changes, which we didn't notice because of the critical situation, but this is a presenting ECG for him. There are many questions also from the audience, Dr. Tahir Salman asking you, uh, why you do start without hemodynamic support? I think mechanical support, yeah, he means. Okay. Uh, it's a big debate between the operators uh, coming back to the guidelines, which didn't support, but I think, I think the wise decision, is it okay to support a patient or to revascularize the patient? I think the wise decision to rush to open the vessel. This is the most important hemodynamic support for all patients coming with a STEMI. This is my approach. Do you have Ampella? Uh, we don't have Ampella. Okay, but have even, ice, even yeah. there, is, there, is, there is no time to, no time to waste. The patient okay. actually blood pressure below 80 and the patient actually went into arrest. And luckily we regained uh, ROSC at that time and no time. And after uh, getting the, the, the shot and, show, and, and showed left main, we, we were in a rush actually to open it. So no time to think about anything rather than opening the vessel and giving inotropic support, which is not a, a, a time consuming. What do you think, Dr. Hatim, if you have a fully equipped cath lab with Impella and you are expert in Impella, you will do the same? So, so I mean, there are various schools of uh, thought in situations like these, and um, 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 I mean, the guidelines are rather ambiguous. I mean, they're fairly clear cut with respect to the intraortic balloon pump, but when it comes to the Impella device, uh, because of um, um, lack of enough evidence, um, the practices vary. So in places that where the impella is readily available and it's commonly used in situations like these, you'd find the operators uh, inserting the impella uh, right off the bat. Or you'd have two operators working side by side, one working on, on putting in the impella and the other is trying to cannulate um, the left main and restore flow. Um, and then there are situations where the operators think the priority is to restore flow. So there is no right or wrong answer here. If it, were, if it, was, if it was me in that situation and I had access to the impella, and I'm, I'm largely um, uh, biased by um, the data that was published from the Henry Ford Center by Bill O'Neill. Um, and they're a very uh, prolific uh, group in research and mechanical circulatory support. I would have actually put in the impeller device. Uh, yes, you want to restore flow. And uh, luckily in this situation, things went very well after um, this, the left main was stented. 
but it could have also gone the other way, um, uh, ballooning or stenting that, uh, that left main, especially if the operator decided to use a slightly oversized stent, might have induced a very bad no reflow um, um, situation with, with TIMI one to two flow in the LED ramus in the ongoing circ. And then the patient goes into, um, uh, into shock and arrests repeatedly, then what? Right, so it could have it could have gone the other way as well. So, like I said, there is no right or wrong answer because the situation is so unpredictable. But um, if it were me, if I had access to the impeller, I'd probably put in the impeller device um, before I'd uh, uh, recanalize the occluded left main. Excellent answer. Okay, there is a logic question as well. Why to don't send these patients for cabbage with so, total surgical? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think there is no window to answer this question, actually, uh, regarding the criticality of the patient, regarding the guidelines, regarding the real life, the real practice. Uh, I'm asking, actually, if any of us, any of our colleagues, has a brief surgeon which attends every single procedure and is willing to take patient with uh, arrest for 20 minutes, and actually has PCI before, multiple Look comorbid conditions. Day. Not an acute situation, Dr. Ahmed. Maybe after one uh, month, about three months. Even in the chronic situation, actually, they are escaping from taking such patients. So uh, for real life, actually, I, 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 I think this question may be uh, questionable <laughs> that uh, any patient thinking, that anyone is thinking to, to, to send a patient for cabbage in such critical situation. Okay. Uh, any other questions Mr. Hatim, from the audience? I, uh, I, I don't think we have uh, other questions. There's a question about uh, whether IVIS would have changed the decision. Um, I'm not sure at which stage IVIS use would have changed the decision. Maybe the, right. uh, maybe they were, they were wondering if you had done IVIS in the first uh, procedure itself and whether that would have changed your decision. Would you have considered doing IVAS uh, in the first session, Prof. Ahmed? As you mentioned exactly, there is many strategies and many policies regarding the operators. And most of the operators think that imaging during the acute STEMI uh, is not of, of, of such importance and such benefits. Uh, again, we are rushing uh, to fix the, and, and to open the affiliated artery. Uh, the optimization, which one of the most important goals of the IVAS is not our Corsair at, at, at that time. So always we are rushing to open the perfect artery, whatever the results, and this is our goal. After that, we can optimize the results later in another session or whatever. But in the acute setting, I, I, I don't think, my own belief that imaging takes a lot, despite it's prescribed that IVAS may help in identifying thrombi, blah, blah, blah. But in acute setting, I think we have to work on what we see and geography and, and, and to try to treat it properly. Especially if you have the intention of bringing him back for another session where um, yes. intravascular imaging may be more informative. Yes. Yeah. Did anyone of you try the self-expanding stent in a segment elevation by current function? That seems more for, suited in such situation. Uh, for, me, for me, I use it, but, but not in acute cases. I don't have experience with, uh, with that stent platform. Okay. okay, I think I read a trial about that, but I think for a couple of years, I don't remember what was the uh, uh, final result about that because I think it seems irrational because of the uh, myocyte edema that happens in the vessel. After that, I think the deployed stent four, it seems in the left mean, I mean, it may be a little bit smaller after subsidence of the uh, tissue edema and, and, and. So I think uh, self-expanding stent that can, ex can be expanded even after two or three days after subsidence, such edema seems more suitable in such situation. Okay, amazing. Okay, I don't see um, any other questions, um, no other comments. Uh, any last comments, Prof. Mansour? I was, I think, a uh, fantastic uh, session, very nice discussion, very nice case, uh, very nice lecture from Prof. Samah, I think, it, about the basis or basics, uh, fundamental basics of an intervention that we have to follow. 
without su such basics, I think we have to be safe to the patient. At least we shouldn't harm if we'll not benefit the patient. So I think a uh, very nice case uh, by Dr. Ahmed. Very nice comments from you, Dr. Hatim, and very nice questions today or uh, queries from the old attendee. I think uh, most of them, I think uh, we're happy. Okay, so please, Dr. Hatim. All right, so with that, and uh, just cognizant of the time, I'd like to perhaps bring the session to an end. I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Ahmed for the amazing session and the highly interactive, very stimulating discussion, uh, and Prof. Mansour for his um, amazing session on uh, uh, subclavian uh, steel syndromes. Uh, it's unfortunate that we miss Prof. Alam, but uh, uh, we'll hopefully reconvene uh, next week. Um, in yet another interesting session, and I'd like to encourage our attendees to join us again next week as well. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you, inshallah. Inshallah. Dr. Mohammed Delphi and Dr. Mohammed would like to talk, please. Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Mohammed. Okay. See you in short. Bye-bye.